Hello, and welcome to this, our second week of Hudson Alpha's Biotech 101. Thank you for joining us tonight. I am really excited to be with you and to cover the content that we're gonna talk about. I wanna first say a special word of thanks to our sponsors, especially our presenting sponsor, Twickingham Advisors, for allowing us to offer Biotech 101 to you, the public, at no cost. I also wanna say a word of thanks to the Jackson Center and the Hudson Alpha Alumni Association. Last week, we talked about the basics, the key concepts around genetics and genomics, a lot of vocabulary. This week, we're gonna turn our attention to how all that plays out in the world of agriculture. But first, I'm gonna do a little bit of additional basic content. So settle in, get comfortable, grab your favorite snack or beverage, and let's dive in. Last week, I talked a lot about the concept of how genetic variation changes the recipe. We use the analogy that our DNA is like a recipe book, our genome is our recipe book, and the individual genes are individual, they're like a recipe. They tell our cell, our body, how to make something. Usually, that's a protein or some other regulatory molecule. But I talked a lot about genes being turned on and off and about how changes in the DNA impact that final recipe. And I had some folks say, can you give us a little more background about what that means? So we're gonna talk about something called the central dogma. Central dogma is a key concept in biology that explains how DNA ultimately leads us to protein. So on the screen, Imagine that the entire cell is this screen, and right here is the nucleus. Your DNA is stored in your nucleus. And so here's one of our chromosomes, and our DNA is stored. It's, it's tightly wrapped around proteins and packed down into this chromosome. And let's just unwind a little bit of it. And this region right here is our gene. And remember, DNA is double-stranded. It looks like a twisted ladder. I've untwisted it partway. When a gene is going to be activated or when its recipe is going to be read, the DNA unwinds and unzips. And then there's a specific molecule, the, I've called it the RNA making machinery. It's actually a complex of proteins and enzymes called RNA polymerase and associated proteins. And it binds at the beginning, at the start of a gene. And it reads through that gene and it makes a copy of that piece of genetic information. And that copy is called RNA. So let me jump back to the analogy. If our DNA is like a set of recipes and a gene is an individual recipe, I want you to imagine with me that this recipe book is incredibly precious. And maybe uh, let's, let's take it back to we've got a restaurant owner who is protecting his recipes. And every morning, he decides what his restaurant is going to serve for that day. And he copies out the specific recipes that his chefs are going to need in order to make this day's food. And he puts them on pieces of paper and slides them underneath the bottom of the door out into the kitchen. So the sous chefs get these pieces, these copied out recipes, and then they can use that, that set of instructions to make the meals. Now, imagine that our chef is really concerned that someone, our master chef is really concerned that someone is going to try to steal the recipes. So he puts them on pieces of paper that automatically break down after eight hours so that you can't actually take the copies of the recipes with you. They're short term. And then the next morning, he decides what recipes he's going to need for that day's meals, writes them out on this super breakdownable, this super breakdownable, that's not even a real word writes it on this temporary paper and slides it under the door. So you've got that kind of analogy, kind of strange, but, but hold with me on that. That's the same way things work inside your cells. So the DNA stays permanently inside the nucleus, protected and away from everything else that's happening in the cells. And the specific genes that are needed to be activated in order to, the recipes that the cell needs it copies into this temporary molecule called RNA. And then that RNA leaves, it's processed and it's prepped, and it leaves the nucleus and goes out into the cell cytoplasm. That's like sliding it under the door. Let's look at a couple of props that might help with this. 
So here's a model of our DNA. Again, you can see that it's double-stranded. It looks like a twisted ladder. We talked a little bit about this last week. I used a slightly different model, but the important information is on the rungs of the ladder. That's, that's where the nucleotides, the A's, T's, C's, G's, that's the instructional piece. If you unzipped this a little bit, took it apart, and followed one set, the RNA polymerase makes a copy. This is the RNA. Now again, it doesn't look like this. These are Connex molecules. They're great to use as, a, as an explanation. But you can see the RNA is a single strand. It's not double-stranded. And the RNA is what goes out into the cell. It's the temporary copy of the instructions. So it's broken down briefly, not over a matter of hours, but sometimes in just a matter of minutes. It really is the short-term molecule. When we talk about COVID in a couple of weeks, we'll talk about um, the RNA, the mRNA vaccines. They're this temporary piece that is injected into your cells and lasts just a little bit of time before it completely breaks down. So we've got our RNA out in our cell, out in the cytoplasm. And there, that temporary set of instructions meets what's called a ribosome. And a ribosome is the protein-making machinery. It reads the instructions in the RNA, which are a copy of the instructions that are in the DNA. And it uses those instructions to pull together amino acids, which are the building blocks of protein, and it strings them together in a very specific order based on the instructions that are in the RNA which came from the instructions in the DNA. So the whole concept of the central dogma is that the genetic information in the DNA is copied into an RNA copy. That copy leaves the nucleus and then out in the cytoplasm meets a ribosome and it's translated into a string of amino acids which form the protein. So you can imagine, I've got a set of baby pop beads and each one of these, let's just imagine it's an amino acid and the instructions in the RNA tell me we're gonna start with the yellow first, then we're gonna add the blue, then the red, then the green, and then on and on and on. Most proteins are hundreds or thousands of amino acids long and the order of the amino acids, and you can see, there we go, you can see that I've got that here on my protein, these little dots right here. These proteins are made up of hundreds or thousands of these amino acids. And then they assume a very specific shape, a, a twisted shape, the way that they interact. This shape is what gives the protein its ability to carry out its work. Just a single string of amino acids isn't going to do the job. It's the way that the amino acids are folded that actually gives you a protein, an, an enzyme, something that can actually do work. So with that in mind, that's the process of how we activate genes, how we make that RNA copy, and then how that RNA copy is used to put amino acids together to give us our protein. Let's now talk about the impact of DNA change, DNA variation. So the first example I'm gonna give you is like turning a volume knob up or down. So I want you to imagine that I actually have a DNA change, a variant, that is right at the spot where my RNA making machinery would normally bind. And so this changes the recognition site. So my RNA polymerase can't find where it's supposed to attach and bind. So if it can never attach to the DNA molecule, it never makes an RNA copy and I never get any protein. So I've completely silenced this gene. I am not getting any usable RNA or any usable protein from it. On the flip side, I might actually have a variation that causes that um, RNA polymerase to bind repeatedly really, really well and make lots of copies of that RNA. This would be like the chef sliding 50 copies of French onion soup under the door. And now the restaurant is gonna have a whole lot of French onion soup that day. I hope that's what customers like. That would be an overwhelming overproduction or overexpression of the protein, which in this case, too much of something can cause a problem. So I don't make enough or I make too much. Let's talk about a different kind of change. What happens if the change isn't in the place where the RNA polymerase binds and initiates the copying, but is further along in the instructions? And in that case, that change shows up in the RNA and changes the amino acid that ends up in my protein. 
So maybe instead of the red pop bead, I have another blue pop bead. That is called a substitution. I've substituted one amino acid for another. I've substituted one letter of my DNA for another. And that change may not have any impact at all, or that change might actually cause so much problem that this protein can't do its job. And rarely, that change might actually give me an even better protein that does an even better job than what it had historically done. And then I've got change that takes place completely outside of the gene, far away from where the gene is located. This change, in all likelihood, doesn't have any impact. Now, it could be that it actually impacts how the gene is regulated. We know that there are some regions that are thousands or millions of letters away that still can control when a gene is turned on and off. But in general, regions way outside of genes are just part of normal variation. They don't impact health and disease or traits, but they're great if you're looking for identity. So when you think about ancestry, using your genetics to determine your ancestry for websites like Ancestry.com or 23andMe, these are the regions they're looking at to determine your ancestry because we know these regions vary from group to group. These are also the kinds of regions that are used when you're looking at forensics, when you've got a DNA sample left behind at a crime scene and you're trying to match it to a panel of suspects. You're not looking at genetic variation inside genes by and large, you're looking at this extra gene or outside gene regulation. So that's a, our last little bit of the basics that just talks about this whole process of how changes in DNA can ultimately lead to these external changes uh, and that whole process of the central dogma and a variation. So now let's take all of that plus what we talked about last week and let's apply this to agricultural genomics. Let's talk about the impact of DNA on um, our crops for food and fuel and feed and livestock. Here's part of why I wanted us to have this conversation. So you can see on the screen behind me, the blue curve is world population over time. The red curve is the percent increase in population. So you can see that the population increase really spiked in about the 1960s and has been dropping steadily ever since. But we still are continuing to grow the population even though we're growing it much more slowly. So that's why we're now at you know, 8 billion people um, around the world. We continue to have more and more individuals that need to be fed. And as more of the world moves from first world to second and third world status, the type of food that they eat changes. And they begin to become accustomed to more meat and dairy products and less rice and simple straightforward grains. So we have to produce more food for a growing world. Here's one of our challenges though. I love our world in data. This is where this particular graphic came from. If you're looking for information, our world in data is probably one of the first places that I would recommend that you go. This particular graphic is showing you the global space that's allocated for food. So we're going to start here, the Earth's surface. 29% of the Earth's surface is land. That over there in gray, 71% ocean would go way off the screen and, and over onto the wall. So about a th not quite 30% of the Earth's surface is covered in land. Of that 30% of the surface covered in land, 71% of that land is actually habitable. We actually can live on it. The rest is glaciers and, and barren land, and generally, by and large, we don't live in those spaces. Of our habitable land, 50% of it is actually allocated for some type of agriculture. So 50% of the land that we can live on, on the Earth, is already dedicated to some form of agriculture. And if you break that down even further, more than three quarters of that land that is dedicated to agriculture is set aside for livestock, either to graze the livestock or to grow the feed that the livestock need to eat. Only 23% of the farmable land is actually set aside for food crops. But if you look at the amount of protein or the amount of calories that we take in from this food, you'll see that 83% of our caloric intake across the globe actually comes from plant-based food, 
that's grown on 23% of the agriculture on our habitable land. So 17% comes from meat and dairy, even though livestock takes up much, much more land. That's one of the challenges that we try to, try to figure out. And if you look at the protein consumption, about a third of our protein globally comes from uh, meat and dairy and two thirds from plant. So the challenge before us is how do we feed an ever-growing population when we have a relatively small amount of land and of that farmable land, a significant amount of that is set aside for livestock, not even for food crops. Let me give you some foundational reminders that'll be similar, it'll be familiar from what we talked about last week. So many traits are controlled by genetic change. I'm showing you the 20 chromosomes of corn. I showed you this slide last week. And the circles here are three genes that are involved in converting feed corn, which is all starch in those kernels, to sweet corn or super sweet corn. We're gonna look at this gene right here called sugary one. And here's a piece of the genetic structure, those A's, T's, C's, and G's. And I've actually highlighted a small piece and you can see I've bolded that letter T. That, a single letter change that goes from a T to a C changes the recipe instructions and actually converts some of the starch in the corn grain into sugar. So this goes from feed corn to sweet corn, one letter change. It changes, it's a substitution that changes the amino acids that causes this enzyme to convert starch into the sugars. But in the same way, the environment is also a key driver of different traits. So I'm showing you on the screen identical varieties of corn. The top row is grown under irrigation conditions. The bottom ear is grown under non-irrigation. So even though genetically they are identical, the environment is a huge driver of how much of this cob actually fills out with ears. And that's true for many of the traits that we look at. It's a combination of genetics and environment. So if we come back to the idea that we have to feed more people on a limited amount of land, and in many parts of the world, the amount of farmable land is slowly decreasing, here are some key goals. We want to create crops that require lower amounts of inputs of water, of rich soil, of fertilizer, but give us higher outputs of grain or of fruit or of uh, biomass. So how can we put in fewer things and get out more? We also are looking for an increase in things that are really desirable to us. This would be something like the way it tastes, the flavor profile, the color, think about a bright red apple or a beautiful orange cantaloupe. The hardiness, how well does it do under issues of drought or under issues of changing temperature? And then it's resistance to pests and other um, infectious diseases. So you are looking to create crops that, again, as few inputs as possible, as much output and is as strong and hearty and tastes good and is beautiful to look at as you can possibly get. There are two key things that have happened over tens of thousands of years that have brought us to where we are with our crops and with our livestock. And the first is the process of domestication. And domestication actually was when ancient farmers took wild plants, took things that were growing on their own in the wild and actually cultivated them and specifically selected for versions of those plants that they could domesticate, that they could tame, and that they could pick versions of the plants that would be worth the labor of cultivating them. So rather than having them grow in the wild and just pick them, capturing those seeds, capturing that grain, and then actually physically planting it in a specific place in the soil. And what some of the conditions you're looking for if you're going to domesticate a plant is you want all the seeds that you plant to germinate at the same time. In the wild, that's not the way that works. That germination varies. But if you're planting a crop, you want them all to come up at the same time. You also want them all to ripen at about the same time so that you can harvest them more easily and not have to come back and harvest over and over and over just tiny bits of each crop.
One of my favorite examples is right here on the screen. So this is Teosinte. This is the wild version of corn. And then you can see the modern version of corn to the right. This is the wild corn cob and kernels. The hard outer covering encases the soft kernels. And there's really only like 10 of them. And you can see it's tiny compared to a quarter. Multiple stalks on the plant. Now compare that to the modern variety of corn, which has one primary stalk, only a couple of ears. The hard outer covering has turned to the inside and is now the cob of the corn. And then you've got rows and rows of corn kernels. There are probably somewhere in the neighborhood of six to 10 genetic changes that take you from Teosinte to modern corn. Six to 10, that's it. It's a small number. And those changes occurred naturally. They were random mutations and early farmers recognized that these specific changes gave them something that was easier for them to turn into food and to cultivate. And so they would collect those seeds. And then as they continued to plant those, an additional random mutation would occur in the genome of the wild corn that gave you more kernels or gave you fewer stalks so more energy could go into filling out those kernels on the single or on the couple of cobs. So that's the process of domestication. And domestication has happened over and over and over as we've taken things that are wild and we've selected for traits that allow us to domesticate, allow us to grow it naturally, or allow us to take wild, uh, the ancestor of cattle, and domesticate them so that they're comfortable being around humans and we've bred them for a specific body shape and body type. And that actually leads us into the second key definition, which is diversification. So domestication tames it, allows me to go from wild to something that I can take care of, that I can cultivate on my own. Diversification is where you say, ah, I'm looking for this specific set of traits. I'm looking for this specific set of characteristics. And I'm showing you some examples of sheep and of chickens and of cows and the process of diversifying them to give you different qualities. Uh, for example, uh, to give you really big muscular cattle or maybe to give you a specific feather pattern of chickens or dogs. Let's think about the diversification process of dogs so that you have teacup chihuahuas and then you have giant mastiff dogs. That's all based on specific breeding to look for a certain set of characteristics or traits. So this process of domestication and diversification has taken place across agriculture for tens of thousands of years. For the vast majority of that time, most of this process was based on what was called selection by phenotype, the trait that you could see. Oh, look, that's a larger piece of fruit. Oh, look, there's more fruit on that tree. Oh, look, this is a larger animal. This animal is more domesticated. It's more comfortable around humans. That's all called phenotype. Those are traits that we can physically look at. But at the heart, what's actually happening is we're choosing based on specific genetic changes that provide us those physical traits that we can see. This combination of genetic variation that gives us multiple pieces of fruit or a larger or a different flavored fruit or an animal that is more comfortable being around humans. But for the majority of this time, we couldn't see that genetics. We had no way to actually track that. So here's a specific example, and hang with me, we're gonna dive deep into the weeds, no pun intended, as we talk about this. So traditionally, this is the way that you would do breeding and selection. So I've got a tomato, I love tomatoes, especially in the summer, a ripe tomato sliced on a piece of bread with some mayonnaise and a little bit of salt is a thing of joy. Now some of you completely disagree with me and you're sticking your tongue out going, ugh, but I love ripe tomatoes. So that's not the grocery store tomato. Let me be really clear. That is not what I'm talking about. But let's imagine we have an elite variety of tomato that's grown uh, in fields or in gardens around the world. It produces lots of juicy red tomatoes. But the problem with this, and you can see from these tiny little dots, these tiny little flies, is that this specific tomato is susceptible to a pest, to a fly-based 
pest. Let's also imagine that I've got another variety of tomato that is a loser in every category you can imagine. The color's not good, it's a tiny crop, a tiny plant, the fruit is small, but its one winning trait is that it is completely resistant to this fly. The flies, when they eat on these leaves or the, there's something about the leaves that repels them naturally. So I wanna take these two varieties, my elite variety and my puny but resistant variety, and I wanna create a tomato that contains all the, desirable variety, all the desirable traits of my elite variety plus the new trait, in this case, resistance to the flies, but I don't want any of the other traits associated with this uh, second variety, with our, our small orange one. So I'm gonna cross them, I'm gonna breathe them, I'm gonna take the pollen from one and put it on the flowers of the other, and I'm gonna do that for multiple plants and I'm gonna get a whole set of seedlings. And I'm gonna grow them up and I'm gonna take a look at them and I'm gonna say, okay, this plant uh, makes lots of fruit, but it's yellow. This plant doesn't make a whole lot of fruit, but it's red. This plant is resistant, resistant to the flies. And I'm gonna select from among those seedlings, from among those actually now full grown plants, the plant that is closest to what I ultimately want at the end of the day. So here's the plant that I've chosen. The fruit's not very big, it's the right color, and it's resistant to the fly. And I'm gonna cross it again with that elite variety. And so I'm gonna take the pollen from one and put it on the flowers of the other. And now I'm gonna end up with a whole set of seedlings and I'm gonna pick one again that is even closer. In this case, I've got a larger plant with a slightly larger fruit. And I'm gonna keep on crossing this back to my original variety. That whole process is called back crossing because I am continually crossing back to the parent, the elite variety, until I get a brand new variety that is big, it's red, it has lots of fruit, and it's got the resistance to the flies. And that's now my new variety. That's the way we have done this for thousands of years. Here's what actually happens at the genetic level as we go through that process, but is traditionally sight unseen to the individual that is doing the breeding. So let's just assume, and this is a super simple example, that our tomato has three sets of chromosomes and it's got a copy from mom and a copy from, a copy from one parent and a copy from the other parent. I don't think tomatoes have moms and dads, but it's got one copy of each chromosome from each of its parents. So six total chromosomes. And let's also, just for argument's sake, in a very simplistic setting, say that here in these boxes are the locations of the genes that control each of these traits. Now, most plants don't have a single gene that controls the, the size of the fruit or the amount of fruit that's produced. There are multiple genes, but for simplicity's sake, we're gonna go with this argument. And right here is the region of the genome that we are interested in because it's got the response to the pest. Our original variety is sensitive. Our other donor, our um, orangey yellow one, is resistant. And to make things even more simple, I'm just gonna color code the DNA that comes from the elite parent in black and the DNA that comes from the other donor in white, just so you can see what's being carried in the next generations from each set of parents. All right, so I'm gonna do my cross. and I'm gonna take the pollen from one parent and I'm gonna put it on the flower of the other. So here we go from one parent and then you can see the other and this is what I've got, pretty straightforward all black chromosome and all white chromosome for each one of these pairs. Now I'm going to go through my next level of back cross. And in this instance, I'm gonna show you something that happens in every single one of the, the, the cells of most living organisms. Certainly uh, things like plants and animals. And it's this really beautiful dance between the chromosomes in the cells that are gonna be eggs or sperm. They actually exchange information. They swap information. So you can see here there's been an exchange of information. So now I've got some that have black and white in this, uh, on each of these pairs. And one of them is gonna, is gonna end up in what ultimately becomes my sperm or my egg. So let's look at this other pair. So here's the exchange. 
Here are my options after they've exchanged information. And one of these is going to find its way into the egg or the sperm. Same way. This process is called recombination, and it happens in all of the cells that ultimately give rise to our gametes, our eggs or our sperm. It happens in plants, it happens in cows, it happens in frogs, it happens in you and me. And it's a way that genetic information is mixed and mingled. It only happens between the two copies of the same chromosome. So you don't have chromosome one recombining with chromosome six, for example but it gives us greater variety. It increases the amount of, of genetic variation that is in a population. And it also, at least in humans, is a requirement in order for our chromosomes to properly separate as we go through the final stage of egg or sperm formation. All right, that was in the weeds. I'm gonna pull us back out just a little bit. So we've now added the copy from the elite parent. And I'm going to continue this process over and over and over until I get to something that looks like this, that has almost all black genetic information. In other words, almost all the genetic information from my elite variety, except for that little white box in the yellow space, which is where the pest resistance is found. So it's got that little bit of genetic information from my resistant parent, and it has all of the rest of the genetic information from my elite variety. So at the genetic level, that's the process of breeding that takes place. Whether we're talking about this in tomato plants or talking about this in cattle or in dogs, we choose based on what we can see, but it's the genetic variation that we're selecting for underneath. Now the problem is, I can't tell that I have 100% gotten to this if I don't know anything about the genetic information. And historically, when we've done this kind of traditional breeding, we've brought along other pieces of genetic information that weren't necessarily so helpful. They might have actually made the plant less, um, more susceptible to drought, but you wouldn't know that unless you grew these plants under drought conditions. So you might think you've got a great variety and you're now growing this for years and then you have a drought year and you pulled in a piece of genetic information that means your plants wilt and die at the first sign of really high heat. Or you might discover that you've brought in a gene that while you are now resistant to flies, you now have a complete susceptibility to like a wheat rust or a mold. So you can't tell when you're just selecting by physical trait what you've actually got at the genetic level. And sometimes that has come back to really haunt us. That's why it becomes so important to know the entire genetic sequence of the plant. Because once you know the genetic sequence, you can now compare different varieties. For example, these are different grains of different kinds of Western Canadian wheat. You can see there's a huge difference in size in those grains. This is controlled by a handful of genetic changes. And if I know the sequence of the wheat, and I can also then sequence each of these varieties, I can identify the specific places where there are genetic differences between, say, this strain and this strain. And that will give me a good insight into the genetic factors that control the size of wheat grain. Same is true here in soybeans. Different sizes of soybeans, the genetics probably is at the heart of some of that. So that's the power of being able nowadays in the modern age to have the sequence of the genome of the plant that you're looking at because it gives you so much more information as you get ready to move into breeding. Let me give you two examples, one in soybeans and one in tomatoes. So this is a, the, the top example. This is a soybean that grows particularly well in salty soil, which is important as you think about crops along the coastline that uh, as the sea level rises, the soil becomes a, has a higher level of, of salt in it. Researchers discovered that the ancestral version of soybean actually contained a specific gene that allowed it to move salt out of the circulation system more easily. So, so the, the roots took up the water and took up the salt that was in the water and they were able to get rid of it back into the soil or sequester it away. But modern soybeans, when they had been selected for domestication, a specific version of the plant was selected that didn't have this specific genetic change. 
So modern soybeans were really sensitive to high salinity. But by actually breeding this specific version of the gene from the wild soybean back in, they actually were able to produce soybeans that grow better in salty soil. Same kind of example with tomatoes. If you're going to grow tomatoes in a, in a greenhouse, if you're commercially going to grow tomatoes, you cannot expose them to 24 hours of light because you will actually burn the leaves. But going back to the wild tomato, which was really about the size of a currant, uh, tiny, tiny little uh, fruit, it actually contained a version of this gene, which is involved in the photosynthesis process, that would be fine under 24 hours of sunlight. Um, nobody ever tested for it because until modern lighting, we didn't have 24 hours of sunlight. But breeding that in allowed tomatoes to be grown under continuous light, which actually increased the yield something like 10%. So that's being able to compare varieties and look at the specific genetic variation and then breed that back in. The same is true of drought tolerance. This is a specific type of corn called Agrisure artesian corn by Syngenta. It actually contains a specific combination of genetic markers from 13 different genes that give this type of corn the ability to grow well under drought. Uh, and part of the issue is that under low amounts of water, typically corn leaves curl up because they're curling up to reduce the amount of water that's lost through the leaf. But when it curls up, it isn't exposed to the sun, so it can't capture the sun's rays and go through the process of photosynthesis and produce sugars, which then could be, which then could be um, transported into the kernels. So this kind of corn, this variety of corn that's got these genetic markers, keeps the leaves open and more thoroughly fills the ears even under drought conditions. That's the kind of information you can begin to gather when you look at, uh, at, at the genetic information of crops. Here are some ads that have shown up in farmers' magazines over the last few years that allude to this concept of using genetics to, to drive the breeding scheme. We're not reinventing the soybean. Oh, wait, yes, yes, we are. You're gonna want a piece of this. This corn has some specific new trait. This is my favorite. Developed with the genetic code to match your zip code. And each of these hint at the concept that using genetics, using the incredible amount of variety in genetics, allows us to specifically design and develop crops that do well under certain conditions. If you think about it, plants are some of the most amazing organisms on the earth. Plants can grow in almost any location. Plants grow in the desert. Plants grow in incredible cold or incredible drought or under in really rocky soil. And they have a set of genetic instructions that allow them to thrive under those conditions. And by identifying that specific set of genetic instructions, we can use that. We can take advantage of the incredible information, the hardiness of all of these plants around the world, and use that to our advantage to grow under a specific condition, to grow under changing climate, to deal with resistance to disease. This is also true not just of our food crops, but also of things for biofuels. So for example, modern biofuels are primarily based on grain like soy or corn. And you can extract the oils um, or the, the sugars and, and ferment them and create uh, ethanol, for example. But the challenge with that is that these kinds of crops grow, they require really rich soil to grow. So to grow these kinds of biofuels, you are taking land away from crops that you would grow for food or for animal feed. The next generation of biofuels can grow in really poor soil on what's called marginal land. And most of the energy isn't in grains, but it's in their leaves or their stalks or even the stubble that's left behind um, in the corn plants. So these are the cellulosic because you're extracting the energy that's contained in the cellulose, in, in the leaves and in the stalk. 
It's much more complicated to do, and right now it's much more expensive than those earlier grain-based biofuels. But if we can use the genetic information that's encoded in these plants to figure out how to make that process of extracting that energy easier, then we can begin to think about these as really viable fuel alternatives. All right, we've just covered a lot of ground. So let's pause for a second and see if we've got any questions. And we'll do this a couple of other times throughout the night as well. We'll stop and take questions. But I know we've, we've talked about a whole lot of content. Um, let's pause and see if we've got any. Let me check my phone. All right, no questions yet. If you've got them, feel free to add them. There are no stupid questions, everybody. Just the question that you choose not to ask. I'm willing to bet that if you ask a question, somebody else watching this is wondering the same thing. Ask away. Let me talk a little bit about the expertise that's found here at the Hudson Alpha Institute for Biotechnology as it relates to plants. I am incredibly blessed and honored to work with some amazing colleagues who study plants, who work in the field of plant science and sustainable ag. Two of them are here on the screen on the right, Jane Grimwood and Jeremy Schmutz. Jane and Jeremy are some of the leaders in sequencing DNA from plants. Of all the plants in the world that have had their genome sequenced, half or more have had that genome sequenced here at the Hudson Alpha, at Hudson Alpha's Genome Sequencing Center. This scientific team are experts at coaxing the secrets out of the most reluctant plant genome. And they've done work over the last decade or more across lots of different crops, from peaches to cacao for chocolate, to peanut, to soybean, to citrus. They've been involved in sequencing that very first genome, because you've got to have a, an, a reference genome to compare against, and then sequencing dozens and dozens of varieties of those plants to identify. These are the specific changes that I see in these varieties that have these different kinds of traits. They've also been involved in a lot of our biofuel work in things like switchgrass and sorghum and other bioenergy crops. So they've worked on both sides of the plant-based arena. Recently, Hudson Alpha has actually expanded the expertise of this group to build a center for plant science and sustainable ag. So in addition to Jane Grimwood and Jeremy Schmutz, we've also added three additional faculty. Alex Harkis. Alex is actually a joint faculty member with Auburn University. He's an Auburn faculty member who, is, who lives full-time on the Hudson Alpha campus. Kangshita Swaminathan. Kangshita is involved in functional genomics, especially around things like, uh, like uh, miscanthus and bioenergy crops and, and how we can use gene editing, which we'll talk about in just a second. And Josh Clevenger. And Josh is involved in crop di trait discovery. So how do we identify the specific genetic changes that give us these advantageous crop traits and genomics-enabled breeding, which we'll dig into in just a second. Peanuts are his specialty, but he's also involved in lots of other crops. And collectively, these five scientists and their research labs form this uh, Center for Sustainable Ag. And one of the things that they're working on is improving the interaction between farmers and the, the users, the consumers, the, the bakeries, the packers, the, the, the people that buy the food and pass it on to you and me, and the research labs to identify what are desirable traits that the consumer and the farmer would like. And can those desirable traits, can we decipher those in the genetics of the crop? And then can we develop these new varieties and do they grow well and do they actually do what we want? So how can we diversify crops, especially here in Alabama? How can we grow crops that will thrive in Alabama's unique climates, which are slightly different in the north than they are in the middle or the southern part of the state? Instead of growing crops that were designed for some other part of the country, the West Coast or the Midwest, where in order to get them to grow successfully here, we have to put huge amounts of water and fertilizer, 
How can we identify crops that would thrive naturally in our own environment? And how can we do that by deciphering the genetic information and by setting up the economic chain the, all the way from the crop to the user, to the consumer, that would allow us to really diversify the crops that you would find here in Alabama or, or in any part of the world for that matter. This is what modern farming will increasingly look like. As our climate changes, as our ability to grow the crops we used to grow drops, we have to find new ways to create the energy, uh, the food and the feed to power our world. This next slide has a lot of detail and I apologize because I'm breaking all my rules about not putting tons and tons of words on the slide, but it's important. There's a lot of content that I want us to walk through here. So these are the ways that we have traditionally and now today can think about breeding and developing new crops, new traits. So the first is the traditional breeding. That's what I showed you with the tomatoes, where you cross one plant with another, you take the pollen, put it on the flower, and you get, you look for something potentially new. You also can cross interspecies, different varieties of crops. Historically, this has happened a number of times. It's how we've gotten wheat and rice. We um, either accidentally or intentionally have crossed things that might traditionally not naturally breed, but actually did in this instance. So those are the traditional ones. Mutation breeding is something that we have started within the last probably 80 years. And that actually involves taking plants or seeds and subjecting them to doses of radiation, maybe x-rays, maybe other kinds of radiation. Radiation breaks DNA bonds. It damages DNA. And then the body, the cell, repairs that damage. And sometimes that damage doesn't get repaired correctly and you get a difference. You get something new introduced. That's going to be especially important when we talk about the role of environmentally driven genetic mutation next week as we talk about cancer. Let me make a real, now having just said that, let me stop and say I'm not talking about creating cancer in plants. But these mutations alter the genetic recipe. It's how we get ruby red grapefruit. If you like your grapefruit bright red instead of that pale kind of yellow, it's because those seeds were exposed to radiation and mutated a gene that was involved in the production of pigment inside the fruit. There are a number of instances over the last several decades of things that you and I eat in the grocery store that were created by mutation-based breeding. Marker-assisted selection is another component. In marker-assisted selection, I'm actually using pieces in the DNA, places in the DNA where I know that there are genetic changes to help drive the kinds of traits I'm looking for. So let's say that I take uh, a crop, I take uh, two plants, and I know that this plant has a set of genetic variations that gives it uh, drought resistance, and I'm breeding it with a plant that doesn't have those genetic variations, and I get maybe a thousand seedlings. I can take a leaf punch, literally a hole punch on a leaf of all thousand of those seedlings, run the genetics, and look specifically at those markers that I know are associated with my trait of interest, that, with drought resistance. And then I can say from that thousand set of seedlings, these 10 are the ones that have the specific combination of genetic information I'm looking for. They move forward into the next stage of my breeding scheme. It's using genetics to rapidly accelerate and drive what you're looking for that you wouldn't have gotten in the traditional breeding. Then there's genetic modification, GMOs. Yes, we will touch a little bit on GMOs, but not a ton. A GMO, a genetically modified organism, in this instance, a genetically modified plant, is when I take a gene, I take a piece of instruction from another organism. It can be from another kind of plant. It can be from something that's not even a plant. And I insert it into the DNA of the plant that I'm working with. And I've added in a new trait. I'll explain that more in just a second, but that's the process of genetic modification. A genetically modified organism contains a stretch of DNA that was not originally present in that type of plant. It was introduced from another. And then there's a whole new field called gene editing. 
And since we first started Biotech 101, gene editing really burst on the scene, you know, six or seven, not even six or seven, five or six years ago, and has now moved to the forefront of the way we think about modern breeding. Uh, this past year, the, one of the Nobel Prizes was jointly awarded to the two women that first developed and identified the concept of gene editing. And it's now used in human health, it's used in animal breeding, it's used in lots of different fields. It's still in its experimental stages, but it's rapidly crossing over to the commercial world. So, let me back up. Let's talk about GM crops. So how are GM crops developed? You've got a simplified version of this slide in your handout that walks you through each of the steps. And I wanna take some time on this because GM crops, genetically engineered crops, are one of those things that people divide over. It's a flashpoint. And much of it's because we don't necessarily explain the science very well. So let me take a minute and walk us through that. So let's imagine that I'm trying to create a plant Maybe it's a strawberry that thrives in cold temperatures. So I've got my strawberry plant, my host plant, and I've got the donor that has my genetic information. And let's say that it's a jellyfish that lives in the really cold waters of the ocean. And I've identified a specific gene in my donor cell, a cold hardiness gene. Maybe it creates a protein that serves as a natural antifreeze that allows the organism to live in the really cold waters. So I'm gonna take that set of genetic instructions and I'm gonna actually cut it out of the DNA of my jellyfish. And then I'm gonna attach some on off switches to it. These are some regulatory regions that let me control how the gene gets turned on and how the gene gets turned off. And these usually come from uh, pieces of bacteria or um, pieces of inactivated virus, but it gives me a way to regulate that gene. And then stick with me on this. We're gonna go a couple layers down. Then I'm gonna drop it in to a circular piece of DNA called a plasmid. I'm gonna drop it right in there and then I'm gonna put that plasmid in a specific type of bacteria called an agrobacteria. And agrobacteria are useful because they can infect plants and they naturally inject pieces of their own DNA into the plant. So agrobacteria do this whether you've got an inserted gene or not. This is, the agrobacteria is a natural way to insert genetic information into plant cells. It's been doing it for hundreds of thousands of years. But the agrobacteria now that contains my circular piece of DNA that includes my cold hardiness, my antifreeze gene, infects my, some cells from my host plant. And it integrates, it inserts that piece of DNA from my jellyfish into the DNA of my strawberry plant. So now what I've got are strawberry plant cells that in the middle of their DNA or in a known place contain that jellyfish cold hardiness gene. And then I can use a process called cell culture to actually grow those cells into a plant. Now, the plant cell doesn't look at this piece of DNA and go, oh, that came from a jellyfish. Genetically, structurally, chemically, it looks exactly the same as every other piece of genetic information. The cell doesn't care where the DNA originally came from, it reads it and interprets it just like it does all of the rest of its instructions. And so now our strawberry plant is producing this, it's reading that gene, like our earliest slides from this session, and it is making that protein that is our antifreeze protein. And if all goes well, and if I did my science correctly, my strawberry plant now is able to withstand cold temperatures. That's the whole concept behind a GMO. The strawberry plant does not grow tentacles from a jellyfish. The strawberry plant would not swim in the ocean. Uh, the strawberry plant does not produce strawberries that taste like jellyfish. It's just that one piece of genetic instruction that now contains that protein that's of interest. Here are some examples of genetically modified crops that are grown around the world. Corn, soybean, cotton are the primary genetically modified crops. This shows you the specific gene and where it originally came from. 
you can see that a lot of these are from different kinds of bacteria. And then here's its purpose. And much of what you're gonna see on the right-hand side is herbicide tolerance. Many of the genetically modified crops that are on the market today are what are called Roundup Ready. And they allow a farmer to plant the crop and when the plant and the weeds come up, they spray the field with Roundup and the plants survive and the weeds die because the plants now contain a gene that gives them a protein that makes them resistant to the effects of the Roundup herbicide. So a lot of these genetically modified crops make it easier on the farmer. There's less tilling, there's less weeding work. Some of these genetically modified crops, for example, with papaya, actually give it resistance to a certain kind of, a certain kind of pest, a certain kind of pathogen. And in some cases, without the genetically modified crop, without the genetically modified trait, the crop would have completely disappeared because of the emergence of this pathogen. Here's the issue. <laughs> Here, no, I'm, I'm doing exactly what I'm about to tell you you shouldn't do. We've been led to believe that GMOs, genetically modified crops, genetically engineered crops, are either all good or all bad, and that all the issues around them are simple black and white, yes or no. Whether we're talking about the impact of genetically modified foods on the environment, or the monarch butterfly, or suicides of farmers in India, it's all this or it's all that. The reality is that just like so many other things in science, there are so many more shades of gray than very clear-cut yes or no answers. But it takes time to dig into the science and to go into the nuance to better understand what is the benefit of genetically modified crops and what are their challenges and how do you try to deal with those challenges. And most of us aren't willing to dig into that. We want someone just to tell us what the answer is. And GM crops, like lots of other things in science, defy simple yes-nos. Now, if you want to know more about GMOs, I'm going to refer you to Hudson Alpha's YouTube page from 2015. I did a whole series in Biotech 201, which is our follow-on course to 101. I did a whole series on ag. And one night, we did nothing but talk about GMOs. And here's the link to that. 90 minutes of discussions about the pros and cons and the rumors and the realities behind those. If you want to dig deeper into that, I would encourage you to take a look at this. I'm going to move us on from GMOs, genetically modified organisms, to gene editing. And gene editing is that last technique that I was telling you about that's relatively new. It uses a set of proteins that are actually part of an ancient by a bacterial defense system. And it's a little bit like the equivalent of find and replace in your word processing software. You can say, you can program these gene editing systems to look for a specific stretch of DNA and then make a certain change. So you can engineer a specific DNA change that now gives you a crop that has a different set of traits. Maybe it's drought resistance. Maybe it produces more protein or more oil in the seed of the soybean. Maybe it actually is resistant to a certain pathogen. Gene editing is changing the way that we think about modifying and adjusting crops. And it looks exactly as if the mutation had occurred naturally. It doesn't include any viral and bacterial sequences. It doesn't include DNA from anywhere else. It is simply an internal modification of the DNA. Now, I'm not saying that it's foolproof. It has lots of challenges, but scientists continue to refine and adjust that. The first genetically engineered food made its way onto the commercial market about a year and a half ago. It was an oil, a soybean oil that had been genetically modified to have a longer shelf life, to slow the process of spoilage. It had been genetically edited, so there was no additional DNA from another organism. It was a genetic change within its own DNA. And we'll see more of these crops come to market and be, and be commercialized 
as well. These are just a few of the headlines over the last couple of years talking about the concept of genetically in, genetic editing. Uh, one of the prime editing uh, vehicles is called CRISPR. So you might hear people talk about CRISPR or CRISPR-Cas9. That's this editing tool. All right, now we're gonna talk, I'm gonna shift us from plants to animals. The same kind of goals are evident when you're talking about livestock and animal improvement. Lower inputs, higher outputs. How do I use less food, but I get more meat or I get more milk? And I'm also looking to increase those same desirable traits, the amount, the characteristics, of how easy is it for me to grow and breed and birth and wean these animals and things like flavor and hardiness and, and value. Let's start with cattle. Now, I am a city boy, uh, so I'm gonna, we're gonna step right at the edge of my knowledge about livestock. Some of you actually watching this may know much more about this. But in cattle, when you're making decisions about how you're gonna breed cattle, and if you're going to, which, uh, which bull you're gonna use and which uh, cow you're going to use to, to mate them, you can certainly just put a bull in a field and let nature take its course. But many individuals, many farmers take a much more scientific approach and strategically try to make decisions about how they're going to improve the characteristics of the next generation of their herd. And they often use something that are called estimated progeny differences or EPDs. And EPDs are a way to measure from animal to animal how well this animal's offspring are likely to perform on a whole set of traits. And those traits are over here on the right hand side of the screen. And they run everything from the weight at birth. And in this instance, lighter birth weights make for easier birth processes. So that's advantageous to how much do they weigh when they're weaned or when they're a year old and you're looking for heavier weights at that point. You're looking for a higher conversion of, of meat, of muscle on the animal. To how tenderness are the steaks. If you're looking at beef cattle, how much marbling is in the steak. So EPDs are a way to look at based on the ancestors of this particular uh, bull or cow, its historical performance based on the number of children, a number of offspring it's already had, and other measures to give you a sense of this particular bull is likely to produce offspring that have a lower uh, birth weight, but have more tenderness and higher marbling for beef, or have a higher yield of milk if they're dairy cattle. So you can look at each individual cow across a whole set of EPDs, and a farmer can decide, all right, here are the cows that are in my field, in my herd, which bull do I want to use to actually breed with that cow based on this particular set of genetic characteristics? You can add to that by incorporating in genetic markers. So the genome, the DNA of the cattle was sequenced uh, in 2009 and it has 22,000 genes. About 80% of those genes are identical to you and me. So we're not that much different from cattle in many ways. You can look at about 50,000 genetic markers at about $17 per head of cow. So you could actually, gen you could genetically analyze your herd or a set of potential bulls, you use a glass slide, which I'm showing you here on the screen, and you can get a whole set of genetic traits that we know are associated, genetic markers that we know are associated with traits like coat cutter color or how long the animal is likely to be able to produce offspring or the tenderness of the meat. So you can now take this genetic information, this set of genetic instructions that we know something about these traits and you can actually add them in to your estimated progeny differences. So now you're adding in another set of information, the genetics. And in this case, it gives you about as much information as if you were looking at a bull that had given, had sired eight to 20 calves. 
So it's giving you a better prediction of what you're likely to find with your herd. And so it increases the accuracy much earlier in the animal's life. And now let's turn our attention to chickens. So we're gonna shift from cattle and the use of genetics to chickens. This is one of my favorite pictures to show our Biotech 101 audiences. We're gonna compare broilers. So these are chickens that are raised to be used as meat. These are not egg layers. You're raising them to be sold, to be slaughtered and sold um, in the supermarket for, for, for whole chickens, for cut up chicken parts, for chicken breasts, for drumsticks. And this is showing you the type of chicken that was most commonly available in 1957, in 1978, and in 2005. So each one of these columns here and on the right hand side of the screen, each column is a different year, a different, the typical chicken you would find from that year. And you can see the side profile and you can see the full on profile at birth, at hatching, 28 days after hatching and 56 days after hatching. So if you just pause and take a look at that, I would imagine several things jump out at you. The first being that from 1957 to 2005, we have bred chickens. We now have chickens that are so much larger. The size of the chicken has grown drastically. There's a big difference between this chicken and this chicken at the same age. And this is in part because of America's fondness of chicken breasts and breast meat. So we've specifically, our consumer preference has driven chicken farmers and chicken uh, wholesale, uh, commercial chicken plants, commercial chicken, anyway, the people that raise chickens, it has driven them towards selecting bigger chickens with larger amounts of breast meat. Now, what drives this? And some of you, if we were in a face-to-face -face session and I asked you what you thought this was due to, some of you would say hormones, some of you might say steroids, some of you might say additives in the chicken food. None of those would be the case. This change in the size of the chicken is driven almost exclusively by genetics, by selecting larger chickens as your original grandparent breeding stock. This is genetics in action, selecting. This is that process of diversification that we talked about at the top of our time together, selecting for larger and larger chickens. Now, there are things that came along with that as chickens got larger, as their body size got larger, we needed to actually also begin to select for stronger legs that actually could carry a heavier chicken body. So we started selecting for bigger chickens and then we realized we also had to do some additional things like to, to keep them able to move around on their legs. This is not steroids. You would have to inject chickens on almost a daily basis with steroids. I don't think anybody is gonna walk into a chicken house and try, even attempt to do any of that. This is all driven by the power of genetics and genetic selection. And what's amazing as you think about is the time that it takes for a chicken to come to market, to come to the weight at which it would be sold at market, dropped from almost 120 days in 1925 to more like about 45 days in 2014. So chickens grew faster and the market weight went from about two pounds to something approaching six pounds in that window of time. So chickens got bigger, it took them less time to get bigger and the amount of food that they needed to eat to put on a pound of weight dropped. So they became more efficient at extracting energy from their food, which allowed them to grow faster and come to market sooner and at a heavier weight. And that's all based on the genetics of the chicken. The power of genetics.
And that was all before we knew the genome of the chicken and the analysis of the chicken. Now you can actually use that same power of genetics to drive that. And there are traits, there are consumers that prefer more dark meat. So instead of a chicken that has a higher amount of breast meat, you've got chickens that have been bred to have more dark meat or to have uh, particular, uh, for people that, that uh, love chickens for, for eggs that are looking at specific colors of eggs or specific uh, protein profiles in the egg yolk, all of those sorts of pieces. Now, you may want to know more about this. You may discover that this is an absolutely fascinating arena. I love agricultural genomics because it is our opportunity to take advantage of the incredible information already found in plants and use it to feed a growing world when we have less and less land in the middle of a changing climate. So if you want to know more about this, I would direct you to the two Hudson Alpha blogs that we have. Shareable Science is the first one. That's the one that I write. Everyday DNA is written by the very talented Dr. Sarah Sharman. These alternate when they come out. So they, they come out on alternate weeks. Sarah's written a lot about the use of agricultural genomics and the technologies for using ag genomics over the last uh, several months. In addition, Hudson Alpha's spring benefit this past year focused all around agricultural genomics. Now, normally we have this on per, in person um, here on campus in the spring, and it's a wonderful gala dinner. This year, because of COVID, it all went virtual. And instead of happening in the spring, it actually happened in August. So at our Vimeo page, you actually can watch the entire virtual spring benefit that was held in August, and you can hear more about the work that we're doing in ag. You can hear from the farmers that this kind of work impacts. You can hear from each of those members of our Center for Sustainable Ag and the work that they're doing. And there's a couple of sections in there from yours truly talking about the impact of Hudson Alpha's genomics work on the food that probably is hanging out in your pantry or your refrigerator. So it's an additional set of tools if you find this subject really interesting. Now, let's pause. Let's take questions because I've covered a lot more ground since that last question break. Okay, Andrew asks, how do we prevent elite varieties from becoming victims of their own success? For example, uh, Cavendish bananas, which were originally bred to be disease resistant, are now so genetically similar they are at great risk. Andrew, that's a great question. And that comes back to this concept of when we are breeding just based on physical trade alone, we don't get a sense of everything else that we often are bringing into our crossbreeding issue. And we created bananas that are so genetically inbred that they are at risk of, of, of susceptibility from disease. And we're at risk of losing the banana that, that many of us love in our breakfast cereal or in banana bread. I think that's where the power of genomics becomes so useful because I can use genomics as I'm driving my breeding selection to make sure that I haven't unintentionally created a bottleneck for myself or brought in some unexpected genetic susceptibility. So this is where knowledge really is power. It also allows us to go back and look at our ancestral varieties, the wild versions or the, the uh, early versions of our crops and look at bringing back some of that genetic variation that we might find incredibly helpful, that kind of diversity that we've bred out over the last several thousand years, certainly over the last few hundred years in the creation of modern, modern varieties. It's a great question. And then we also have a question uh, is there any research being done at Hudson Alpha with editing the genes of microorganisms that have a symbiotic relationship with plants? Ah, so if, if you think about it, a plant is more than just the actual plant itself and the soil that it grows in, because many of these plants have bacteria and other microorganisms all around them, on their leaves, in the soil, in the nodules of the plant that actually help it take in nutrients or help protect it. Uh, 
So there's this, as the questioner asks, there are this, this great relationship between the microbiome of the plants and the microbiome of the soil and the plant's ability to do its job. Hudson Alpha doesn't specifically focus on that microbiome plant uh, relationship. There are groups that are doing that, and then those kinds of lessons that you're learning can be applied to think about maybe if the soil lacks a certain set of microbiome, maybe there are certain bacteria that you could add to the soil, much like we add fertilizer or, um, or, or, or other organic material, you could add uh, beneficial bacteria to help those crops grow even better. That's a really fantastic question. And the field of genomics allows us now to analyze all those different bacteria, all those different microbiomes that we couldn't do even a decade ago because we just didn't have the tools and the capacity to do that. I think that that is it for tonight's questions. So we've, we've covered our content. Uh, that, that's kind of a quick dip into the field of agriculture and agricultural genomics and, and where the field is taking us. Again, if you're really interested in looking at the GMO piece, take a look at the YouTube page from 2015. I'll also tell you now that in the winter of 2022, we'll offer Biotech 201. That's the follow-on class to this. And currently the plan for that is that we're gonna go back and dig into agricultural genomics. What have we now learned about gene editing? What are we now understanding about the way plants take in nutrients and the way that we can use that genetic information to create things that grow better under changing climates when there's less and less available land? Next week, we are going to cover the field of cancer. Cancer is a genetic disease at heart, not necessarily something that we inherit from our parents, although a small percentage of cancers are inherited mutations that we've uh, received from, from the previous generation. Most of cancer are mutations that we've acquired over our lifetime, changes in our DNA that take us from a typically functioning cell into a cell that's grown out of control and spread and invaded into other body tissues. The, I guess the good news is that the field of genomics now allows us to understand so much more about cancer that it has transformed the way that you can diagnose and the way that you can treat and the way that you can think about long term how we live with cancer instead of cancer being something that we die from. So I will look forward to seeing you on next week's episode of Biotech 101. Thank you for joining me tonight and have a great night, everybody. Take care.